name is Andrew Todd, and I'm here today to introduce you to Roger Rule, the author of The Rifleman's Rifle, the host of the series of episodes, Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Andrew. Roger, let me ask you first, what is the definition for special guns? Uh, special guns are uh, those guns that uh, gun enthusiasts may have heard of but never encountered. And I, for my selection, I narrow the focus down to uh, guns that have an evolutionary or revolutionary place in the history of sporting arms over the last uh, two centuries and have become a classic because of it. And uh, what do you have to show for us today? Uh, the gun I want to show today logically follows from the last two episodes. In the first episode, <clears throat> we did uh, my favorite gun, the, the Winchester 364 Model 70, the one which I've written a book about it, uh, the Rifleman's Rifle. And the second episode, we covered the Rigby, a very special made Rigby uh, that, uh, that used a Mauser, an actual Mauser action from Orbendorf Mauser. And the those two guns both had a standard length Mauser action. Even the Winchester Model 70, as we pointed out, was a, was a refined Mauser action. Today, we're going to look at a, um, a review, a rifle that has a Magnum Mauser action. What is a Magnum Mauser? Is it just a Mauser that shoots Magnum cartridges? The simple answer to that is no. Um, in ninth, the word magnum in the gun industry really has two different meanings. It's, it's used two different ways. It's, it's used for cartridges, magnum cartridges, and it's used for magnum actions. Uh, this started uh, in 1912 when Holland & Holland first introduced the 375 belted uh, rimless magnum cartridge, later to become just the 375 H&H magnum. But a year before, in 1911, Rigby um, went to Mauser. At that time, they had an exclusive, uh, um, exclusive arrangement with Mauser just to supply Rigby only with uh, Magnum or not uh, Mauser actions. And Rigby went to Mauser to uh, to build a special large action for their uh, new 416 Rigby cartridge. And uh, we covered that in the last episode. This was a time when Great Britain owned India and most of Africa. And it, safari hunting had, be, had started in India 100 years before and had become very popular. The uh, rifle of choice was a big bore double rifle and uh, for the most dangerous and largest game. Um, those rifles were exp extremely expensive and only the uh, gentry could, could afford them. But these lands were protected by the British military and the British officers that were stationed there were intrigued by the uh, safari hunting. But a British officer couldn't, uh, it would take his entire annual pay to buy one of these big double rifles. And Rigby figured this out and knew there was a market for uh, people who couldn't afford the big double rifles. So they planned on de uh, developing a bolt-action rifle that was more affordable. However, the bolt, right here I have three cartridges. The first one on my right, your left, is a 470 Nitro rimmed cartridge, typical that was used in a uh, big double rifle. That particular cartridge is a 470 Nitro developed by Joseph Lang in 1900. Next to it, the smaller cartridge in the center is a 30 6 that was developed in 1906 for the standard length Mauser. Uh, it's a rimless cartridge, which a rimless cartridge is what is required for bolt action. And Rigby needed a large rimless cartridge. That's why they developed the 416. Uh, Mauser then developed uh, the action for it. Man, the result was what we're calling the big Magnum Mauser. The crazy thing is most of the cartridges for the Magnum Mauser don't have the word Magnum in them. The 
575 Nitro, the 500 Jeffrey, the 505 Gibbs, 450 Rigby, 416 Rigby, 470 Capstick. None of those have the word Magnum in it. The cartridges that came along with the word Magnum as a suffix, the 300 Winchester Mag, the, the first the 375 we already mentioned, H&H &H Mag, and then Holland did the 300 H&H &H Mag in, in 1925, and uh, the later ones, the 7 millimeter Remington Mag, all of those cartridges are shorter, and they fit the standard length action, not the Magnum action. They'd be shot in guns like the Winchester Pre-64 Model 70 or the Browning High Power. So with Rigby having an exclusive with Mauser, does that mean only Magnum Mausers have been in Rigby only made guns? No, that's a good question. Um, the Magnum Mauser was developed in 1911. In 1912, Rigby lost their exclusivity. Now, immediately the other London makers had figured out what Rigby was doing and saw this market. So they could buy the Magnum Mauser from Mauser. And makers like Greener, Gibbs, Jeffries, Holland Holland, Wesley Richards, all got into this market. But war, but it was a short market because World War I stopped the production uh, become be, in Germany being the enemy, stopped the production of the Magnum Mauser. In fact, uh, Mauser didn't pick up making sporting arms again until 1966. Uh, and throughout 20th century, they didn't make a Magnum Mauser action. But the name Magnum Mauser, or just Magnum action, became uh, synonymous with any oversized action bigger than a standard length at Mauser. And there were others that answered the call. For instance, uh, the first one was a big French Brevix action. Now made, now made in America under it's the Granite Mountain action. There were others. There was uh, on this, the old Czechoslovakia. Now the Czech Republic put out the uh, uh, BNRO ZKK 602. Now the CZ 550 uh, in South Korea. Balska BBK 02 was made in Africa. Vector action and uh, then several in Germany that are that are uh, proprietary, Heim, Reimer Johansson, and finally now there's a new one in Finland, the Sako L691. So which Magnum Mauser do you have for us today? For our episode today, I have chosen one recently made by Heim. It's a Mauser action. It's a German Magnum double square bridge action, and it's totally made in-house by Heim. And we're going to move over to the table and look at it compared to uh, the rifle we saw last in last episode, which was just a standard link Mauser action, so we can get a comparison of the size differences. First, let's compare the size of the Magnum Mauser with a standard link Mauser action. Uh, and I've set up one here that we used from last week, the Rigby uh, magazine rifle. Um, it has the standard link that Mauser action. The gun of today is the Heim uh, Express Rifle with the Magnum Mauser action and um, I've set up a vernier caliber here to give you an idea. This is already set for the magazine well on the standard length Mauser and if I move it over to the Magnum action you'll see uh, there's a, so much more length in the in the Magnum action. That's just one way to measure it. Usually the length of the action is uh, technically measured from the, t the tang to the front of the receiver bridge, but this gives you an idea of the size differences. I've chosen this rifle today because I think I personally had something to do with its creation. Uh, after I tell you the story, you can decide when uh, when I was living in Hawaii, I bought my first Heim Magnum Mauser, a big double square bridge Magnum Mauser rifle called their uh, Heim Express rifle. And it was also in 416 Rigby caliber. <clears throat> but I, would, I bought it through the internet. And um, when I received it, 
from the U.S. mainland. Uh, it was a massive, really big rifle. It was everything the advertiser said, so I couldn't return it, but I had no idea how big it was. Uh, when I placed it in my gun vault, it just made all my other guns look like BB guns. Um, it was just a big gun. And I, <clears throat> I thought, well, maybe to um, justify its huge size, I'll get it in something like a big, gigantic 500 Jefferies or 505 Gibbs. So I made a call to Chris Sells, uh, the head of uh, Heim USA, and uh, talked to him about it. And he knew of a way to have it reboard. So I sent him the rifle. He, he related on to a, a, an outsource uh, agent in Arizona. And uh, it was going to be a reboard to 505 Gibbs. After uh, a couple of weeks, uh, I got the guy's phone number. I tried to call him. I wanted to talk about a few things before he did the work. And he never returned my calls. And uh, there were several calls he did not return. I could not get in touch with him. And meanwhile, I found another one, another gunsmith who could rebore it up in uh, uh, Colville, Washington. It was called Clearwater Reboring. It was done by Jim, uh, run by Jim DeBell, who has, re uh, he's now passed away. But Jim was also in the American Custom Gunmakers Guild. <clears throat> and so I called Chris of Heim and asked him to return the rifle, which he did. Uh, no reflection on him for the problem. Uh, as I said, it was an outsource agent. But, and the nice thing about it is Chris returned it in a, in a nice Heim case for me, so I got something out of that. I shipped the gun up to uh, Jim DeBell and uh, talked to him. He was very uh, available. He had special hours of the day he would take calls, and uh, he also answered emails very well. Um, I can't remember how long it took it. Really, it didn't take very long. And he had returned the rifle to me, and he had done a splendid job. I mean, the, you could it almost looked like Heim had done it themselves on the metal work. The problem was it still had a big clumsy stock, and I couldn't figure out why it fit so badly. And um, it seemed like the pistol grip was set way, way you know, too far back. So. I added an in, a really ugly inch and a quarter recoil pad to get that problem solved, and that still didn't fix it. So I sold the rifle. Um, unrelated to that, but, but definitely a part of this story, uh, a few weeks later, uh, Ralph Martini of Cranbrook, British Columbia, who's also in the American Custom Gunmakers Guild, He's, uh, he builds the Martini Hagen single shots and he does a beautiful job on big Mauser bolt type bolt action. And uh, he and his family came to visit me in Hawaii. And um, I told him about the Heim and I, we talked guns. And after he returned to Canada, I bought one of his custom made bolt, big bore rifles. And when I received it, I had seen his stocks in uh, on his website, but I was just amazed, not only by the way they looked, but by the way this rifle fit me. So I don't know how long it was after that, not too long, I, I talk, was talking to Chris Sells again at Heim, and I told him uh, about Ralph's visit, because he knew Ralph. In fact, I found out at the, in that phone call that he knew Ralph. And, um, uh, I, I was just telling him what had happened with the Heim, and I had had to sell it because the stock just was horrible. And um, I also told him how well I liked the new stock from uh, Ralph. Um, later, uh, I guess the next thing that happened was, I, uh, it was actually a few months later, I called Ralph to buy another gun. And during the course of that conversation, he surprised me and said he had been visited by uh, emissaries from Heim in Germany. They wanted, brought a barrel uh, action, and it was their new big double square bridge action. Uh, they wanted him to uh, uh, stock it and to uh, ship it back to them, which he did. 
and he told me they liked his stock so well that they had made an agreement uh, on that um, their new double square bridge bolt action uh, express rifle was going to be made with with his stock and uh, so it, that's you know just surprised the heck out of me because I didn't know this was happening you know behind the scenes so there's the story you can decide for yourself uh, one thing that followed up is Chris did offer me a, a nice discount to buy one of the new rifles when they came out sounds like to me you did have some involvement thank you uh, Ralph's new design by Heim was for for this Heim new double square bridge Magnum action is basically uh, giving it an, an English look with a safari styling uh, but the rifle I have here today isn't it's not the one that Chris offered offered me but it's a great example uh, of what I want to show as far as the uh, the, the current new um, martini styled uh, Heim Express rifle that debuted in 2011. Curiously, Heim is marketing it as uh, German quality English styling. Before we look at the rifle, here's a little information about the maker. The founder, Frederick Wilhelm Heim, uh, started the company in 1865 in Sewell, Germany. Sewell was to uh, the gun-making trade for Germany like London is for Great Britain. In 1891, Heim patented the first three-barrel gun that uh, was without exposed hammers. That's a very high distinction. To say it another way, they patented the first hammerless drilling. Uh, the U.S. didn't know too much about Heim in the 19th century as Heim's markets were east especially selling arms to Russia when Winchester was selling arms to Russia. Uh, but in 1912, Heim shifted their export emphasis from Russia to the USA. The two wars with Germany slowed arms production for sporting arms and stopped markets to the U.S. After World War II, though, in 1945, uh, with Sewell in East Germany, Heim moved to the lower Franconia and stopped arms production and concentrated their manufacturing on uh, miscellaneous things, cuckoo clocks, slide rules, and other non-firearm -fire products. It wasn't until 1995 when Heim built a modern weapons factory in Gleitschemberg that they resumed making sporting arms for export. The company went public in 2002 and changed the name in 2007 to Heim AG. In the gun industry, Heim has always had a reputation as a maker of high quality guns. And their top tier guns are on par with the uh, English best guns. You can check out their website at www.heimusa.com. Now let's uh, turn to the rifle of the day. It's uh, Heim's new express rifle with Ralph Martini stock. It's got a 24 inch barrel and it's in 416 caliber, uh, 416 Rigby caliber. And I'm going to lift it up and uh, remove the scope, which has tally quick detachable scope rings. Uh, first of all, check it for safety. Take the safety off. And if you see the chamber is empty, I'm going to remove the bolt. The bolt release, but it pulls out. Set the rifle down. And I can demonstrate, you can see the uh, long extractor, which shows that it's a true Mauser. It has control round feeding, which shows when the uh, cartridge is held by the extractor and the uh, other left uh, bolt lug. So gravity doesn't affect it. Then uh, there's a third safety lug on the bolt. When the uh, bolt is in, you see the bolt is straight down, typical of a Mauser. A FN, Browning FN Mauser has a curved back. Winchester's Model 70 slant back. The true Mauser is straight down, just like this one, where they follow that part. What's different from the true Mauser is 
the fact that you use the Winchester Model 70 safety. And what's crazy is it doesn't say safer fire, which indicates <clears throat> that uh, it's becoming a standard in the in the industry. When it's forward, it's in the fire position. Well, let me, let me put it in safe. Now it's in the uh, safe position. You can't pull the trigger. You can't open the bolt. In the middle position or number two position, you can't pull the trigger. But you can operate the bolt. You can put a cartridge in. This is a snap cast. And, or you can take a cartridge out. And then in the, of course, in the fire position, now you can pull the trigger. But I want to pull the trigger unless the snap cap is in to protect the, the striker. So I will pull the trigger. And you see it just breaks like glass. It's very lightweight. Supporting my claim that Heim's high-end rifles are made the same way a custom maker makes them, uh, even looking at Heim's own website, I want to quote this. It's, they say, uh, and I quote, Heim's high-grade rifles are still built by hand, and every part is made and finished in-house to the point that no two parts on two Heim rifles are interchangeable. Each is hand-fitted to painstaking tolerances, close quote. Continuing with the description of Rouse new rifle here, we've turned it around from the last uh, position so you can see some of the things I want to point out. I'm going to look at the metal first, then the wood. Um, here showing the double square bridge, magnum and length uh, action. These uh, receiver bridges have been machined to fit the tally quick detachable rings and the, the, <clears throat> the barrel is a 24 inch barrel it's made of the finest Krupp steel it has the safari styling in that the front ramp is uh, banded the sling eye is banded and the uh, island block for the rear sight is banded the sights consist of a silver bead the rear sight is an express sight similar to the Rigby we looked at last week. It has two leaves, one standing and one folding. Um, bottom metal is uh, the straddle hinged floor plate with a center bow release. And set this back down for a second. Other metal parts include uh, the, the cross bolt, which reinforces the stock from the heavy recoil. The uh, pistol grip cap, which is steel, and the sling eye on the uh, rear end of the stock. Um, looking at the, probably the most prevalent feature about the metal is this color case hardening. It has a very unusual look compared to the regular gun bluing. For any of you who do not or want to see a <clears throat> A demonstration of how that's done we have a uh, website on our sidebar for you to uh, go to to look up but just to give you a quick idea of how it's done the parts are separated and polished and then packed in one part bone to one and a half part charcoal put in a heat treated oven cooked uh, 1300 degrees then back down to 1100 degrees and quenched in oil uh, I don't know if that's the way Heim does it that's just a traditional process but what in what you end up with is all these colors these beautiful colors and it affects the receiver the breech bolt sleeve the trigger guard the floor plate and of course the floor plate has the gold uh, makers name in gold Heim on it and nicely contrast and even uh, Time has done it. This heat treat, this uh, color case hardening to the rings on the tally uh, scope rings. <clears throat> and it kind of looks like uh, gasoline floating in water, if you've ever seen that. Uh, to me, that seems to be the way it looks to me. The Looking at Ralph's woodwork, his design, it's the English styling has the red ru rubber recoil pad, famous on English guns, clear back in the 19th century. Uh, classic comb, not fluted. Shallow uh, radius or open grip on the uh, grip and the 
forearm is a tapered, narrow, shortened forearm. Those are all English uh, characteristics. It also has an ebony tip, and of course we talked about the pistol grip cap. Uh, stock is finished in an oil. It's oil finished, and uh, the check ring is unusual for most guns. This is called a Holland and Holland style check ring with a reverse curve on uh, the two panels of the wrist, which both end in two point patterns. On the forearm, the check ring wraps totally around and ends with uh, eight point patterns. And in the check ring, both uh, the wrist and the forearm, there's a uh, very tasteful uh, plan of single and double borders. It looks, it looks really good. Looking at all the inscriptions, the first one that grabs your eye is the maker's name, gold filled on the floor plate uh, with a case colored background. The left side of the receiver has the maker's name again in their logo style next to the word Germany. High on the left side of the barrel chamber is the caliber designation 416 Rigby and under that are two German proof marks and next to that the letters DE followed by the number 11057. DE is the country code for Germany and 11057 is the serial number of the gun. There are no other inscriptions on the exterior of the rifle, not even an indication for safe on the safety. This model, safe, uh, model 70 safety is becoming so universal that Heim assumed the shooter or owner would know when pointed forward as fire. The fit of wood to metal couldn't be better. It's meticulously perfect. The finish is <clears throat> executed without a flaw. On custom quality guns, the length of pull should always be specified. This one has a 14 and a half LOP over a 5 8 solid old English red recoil pad. Weight of the rifle with scope is 11 pounds, 8 ounces. Uh, speaking of the scope, we see this one is a top-end German Schmitten Bender, 1.25 by 4 variable with a 20 millimeter objective lens and a 30 millimeter tube diameter, which is an African favorite. It has the unusual reticle number nine with the little inner circle overlaying what would be a German number four reticle without the circle. In other words, it has a circled crosshair reticle with heavy posts at three, six, and nine o'clock. When I pick this rifle up and shoulder, throw it to my shoulder, It just, the, the, both the open sights and when the scope is on it, perfect alignment. It's just, uh, it points like a dream. It's, uh, it's actually a very handsome rifle. In fact, uh, its figure is higher quality, it has more figure, it's an English walnut and has more uh, figure than you usually see in a 416 Rigby. This is, kind of a marble cake figure. And um, so it's just a, a very handsome rifle. In fact, I would go as far as to say, it's probably the best looking rifle I have ever seen in a 416 Rigby. And that's it. That's our show for the day. I wanna thank you, Andrew, for joining. Thank you, viewers, for watching. And I hope you, uh, if you enjoyed this, you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel, share with others. And look for us next week when I have another very interesting gun to show you next week. Thank you very much. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.